Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to a new year of Travel Massive Live. I'm Kirsty, your host. Uh, and if you didn't already know, I work for a marketing we trust who sponsor these webinars. So we work with uh, many travel companies, including Expedia, Skyscanner, and Kayak, providing digital marketing and analytics. So today we've got Jean with us. Who... Hi everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> with the Travel Massive uh, chapter leader from Melbourne. So um, we're going to jump straight in. Uh, and let's start learning about travel blogging for 2019. Take it away, Jean. Oh, thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to some fun times today. Um, just a quick little thing. I work from home, so I don't have a video going of my face at the moment. It's also a million degrees here in Melbourne, so nobody's looking fantastic. I also have two little dogs that are currently sleeping. But if you do hear them barking, I preemptively apologize. They're super adorable, but they don't understand the work-life balance that I have here. So today we're going to just have a bit of a deep dive into the way that travel blogging has changed and the expectations that the industry have on travel bloggers and certainly the expectations that travel bloggers have on themselves. So we just want to have a look into some of the different tools that have come about in the, sort of the last 18 months, two years, which we're expected to use, expected to be experts in, as well as some things that will just help make your travel blogging experience a little bit more efficient. So a little bit of an introduction to me. This is me. You're going to see a lot of photos of me in this presentation. Um, so sorry, not sorry about that. As Kristen said, I am the Melbourne chapter leader for Travel Massive. I've been the chapter leader for about three years now. I'm also the content creator at my own brand called Travelling Honeybird. And I've been blogging since 2011. So Travelling Honeybird, I started in 2013. And before that, I was actually a food blogger. So I was one of those annoying people that got to go to amazing events, got to take photos of food and then eat the food. I walked away from that um, mid-2013 because we got to a stage of don't you know who I am in the industry and certainly here based in Melbourne and Sydney it got quite vicious so a lot of people were going to restaurants and whatnot and they weren't actually paying for food they were going having like three four hundred dollar meals with wine and then leaving so you know, it's not wasn't the most pleasant experiences to be in because you'd be at you know the restaurant or something taking a photo of food and you'd be asked to leave. So um, later on, I'll have all my other contact details, but you can find me on all of the fun socials at Honeybird Travel. So somehow I get paid to do fun things like these. So here are just a few fun little photos of me um, in Indonesia and a couple that I'm in Melbourne. And it's just one of these really weird things that people kind of go to me, oh, how do you actually get paid to do this? And how is it that you're getting regular and consistent work? So that's sort of one of the things we'll talk about today. Aren't I just so lucky? Look how impressed my face is. That's probably one of the worst things you can ask or say to a travel blogger is, aren't you just so, so lucky? I don't believe in luck. I believe it's all hard work and dedication to your craft. So if anybody needs some time now to go grab a coffee, some water, whatever you feel like you need, pop off and go grab it before we start in. A little bit of housekeeping for today as well. I won't be covering how to set up your travel blog. I'm going to assume that if you're here, you already have a travel blog that is set up. If you do want guidance on how to set up a travel blog, contact me and I can put you in contact with some of our Travel Massive members who have some great articles on how to set up your travel blog. Other things I'm not gonna be covering today is SEO and affiliate marketing. Now, I do believe that these are amazing tools for every blogger. I just don't have the in-depth skills to teach you how to do amazing SEO or affiliate marketing. Again, if you want to reach out to me, I'm more than happy to point you in direction. Travel Massive has some amazing members that are doing wonderful things in the SEO and affiliate marketing world. I am not one of them. I have tried and I have mildly failed and I will be dedicating more time in 2019 to SEO and affiliate marketing. 
So again, happy to pass on details for everybody. Um, it's what we do here at Travel Massive, connecting our members, especially when you're like me and you just don't have the skills in an area. So one of the things that I want to talk to you about today is that just the changing face of travel blogging. Um, when I started, it was certainly like you just had a website and you wrote content and you had some photos and people loved it. Um, for example, I got my first brand ambassadorship with a clothing company here in Australia when my blog was three months old. You know, I probably had 20 articles, if that, and it wasn't really an issue. It was just kind of, ah, oh, they like me, I like them. We tried it out and it worked. And I worked with them for two and a half years before they closed the brand down, which hopefully wasn't because of me. So one of the things is that travel bloggers now and content creators, you're expected to be so much more. You know, you're expected to be a marketing wizard, a community manager, you're supposed to have really savvy business skills. And that's just the start of what brands are now expecting from us. Uh, also throughout this presentation, I won't be using the term influencer. I think it's a bit of a wanky term, but it is also heavily reliant on Instagram. I'll talk a little bit about Instagram later on as well. But one thing I'll say is that what we do at the moment is we are content creators, which goes so much further past the world of Instagram. So that's something that I really do push a lot about when I'm mentoring bloggers is to change your mindset about just being an Instagram celebrity and say, I'm a content creator on multiple platforms. And once you sort of start to change that mindset, I think we just get you know, a much better overall business person developing. One of the things is like, are you actually a social media manager? Now, it no longer is just having a following simply enough for us. We're noticing more and more that brands are asking travel bloggers to have in-depth knowledge about your audience. So it's not just going, well, you know, my range is 25 to 34, predominantly female, and they're from Australia. No, people actually want to know, okay, what do these women like? What are they clicking on? How are you engaging with them to produce a tangible result? So it's really going deep diving into like your audience, who they are as people, not just who they are according to your Jetpack statistics. Now, when we talk about Facebook, one thing that I'm finding a lot of these days is that people are after more than just a Facebook page. So people want you to have a business page. The brands that you're working with are saying, I want you to have a Facebook page and it needs to be a business page. And I also want to have access to your analytics. So if you're not yet using the branded content tool, I would heavily suggest you are if you are doing work with brands. So it's a little like handshake tool that is at the bottom of your post. And what this does is this allows the brand and it's something you have to set up in your settings as well to view your insights and also to boost that post for you. Um, if you're based in Australia at the moment, you may have seen on your Facebook probably 30 or 40 posts, and that's not even an exaggeration, um, from Tesla Towels over Christmas in December. They did a massive marketing campaign with travel bloggers in Australia. And most people who worked with Tesla use the branded content tool. So it does mark that post as a sponsored um, paid post. And it just did allow the brand to put money behind that advertising. So it's a really important tool to use. It's a bit contentious um, with people about, you know, I don't want my audience to know it's sponsored content. Facebook itself is getting super, super smart with this. And if you were saying words like, thanks to, it was great working with, blah, 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 and you're not using the branded content tool, you run the risk of your content being flagged as paid and you haven't declared that and your post being taken down. Uh, it happens more often than what you would think and you can't get that post back up. You can uh, get it put back up with the branded content tool, but you've lost all of that prior engagement 
and all the statistics behind it. It's just no longer there in your Facebook business account. Other things that brands are really asking us for is, are you an administrator of a group? So no longer do you just need to have your business page where you've got all your content scheduled out, you're using the branded content tool, you know, you're doing a great job. Brands want to see that you have access to a group that they can tap into. Um, I was in a meeting last week and that was one of the first questions that came up about Facebook was how many groups do I admin? And for me, I'll be really honest and transparent throughout this talk. I admin two. One of them is a Travel Massive Australia one. One is another Australian based one. And the brands were interested in buying access to my group. So it's not something that um, I do, but it was a really interesting change compared to 2018 meeting with brands where they just wanted to see that you had a regular Facebook page, like a business page that you were doing all your content on, that you're getting good engagement from your audience. Now they're wanting to go to the next level and tap into almost your inner circle. People are also asking how many groups are you participating in? Um, you might not notice that, oh, sorry, someone's just asked something. Can you decline that? Um, a lot of PR reps are now in a lot of the Facebook groups, a lot of the larger ones where there's social share threads going on and they are subtly asking how many of these are you participating in? It's another way that brands and smart, savvy PR people are gauging the engagement that you have with an, an audience. So to sort of judging, did this post actually get really good social shares on Facebook? Did it get a thousand shares? Like your plugin is telling, or was it the fact that you have participated in half a dozen social share threads? So a lot of people are sort of stepping away from Facebook saying it's a pay to play platform, which in a lot of ways it is, but it's still one of those vital tools that we need to have and we need to be using. And because you can schedule so much content so easily, and I just do mine through the Facebook page business um, page managers app. I don't bother using a third party one. I found that when I did use third party app, it didn't actually give it great visibility. And I know that Facebook doesn't give you great visibility anyway. So for me, it was just much easier to go in. If you go into the tools section, you can have a whole heap of drafts there. You can schedule content up to two months in advance. So if you are doing a lot of traveling, it's super useful just to be able to schedule everything and not have to worry about it if you don't have access to Wi-Fi. Twitter. So many travel bloggers last year jumped back on the Twitter bandwagon. The tweet isn't dead yet. Um, couldn't help but throw in a Trump reference there. Twitter is really making a comeback as more and more people are looking for almost real time engagement with you, um, your audience, other content creators. So I just can't reiterate how important it is to have Twitter and to have engaging content on Twitter. Twitter is probably one of the most easiest platforms to schedule your content. There are so many uh, different options. There's um, Buffer, Hootsuite, Social Pilot, you know, and these can all be free. A lot of the apps and um, programs that I'm talking about today have free access. So you do get limited access to them, but they are you know, free of charge, which for me is great because travel bloggers, we actually don't really like to pay for too many things. If you have the time, participate in Twitter chats. These are just such a great way to grow your audience, to engage with your peers. There's some really fun ones out there. Um, Shane Dallas runs one called Travel, the, uh, the Road Less Traveled. So they've got a Facebook group as well. If you join up the Facebook group, you get the heads up on what the questions are going to be. Now for me, I think of the current time zone differences to take part in that Twitter chat. I would have to be up at 4 a.m. in the morning which I really don't actually want to do. But because this Facebook group gives you the questions and they tell you how they schedule them out, you can actually go into one of your scheduling programs and schedule all your responses 
to the questions, which just makes it so much more fun because you can wake up in the morning and there's a whole heap of engagement that's there on your account as people have responded to you. So I just love the Twitter chats. They are kind of a bit of an old school thing, like a 2015 thing, I feel, but they're making a huge comeback and brands are starting to have a look at them again and going, well, hang on, how can we actually use Twitter for the benefit of the world and not so much just for, you know, political arguing. Another thing that's really useful to use on Twitter is some hashtag research. If you are looking to maybe build some backlinks, find a little bit of work, the two hashtags I've provided there, the bloggers wanted and the PR request are super popular. Um, when I was tidying up this presentation yesterday, bloggers wanted had been used about 260 times in that hour when I was checking. Really great if you're based in the UK. Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pacific hasn't quite picked up on it yet, but UK PR firms are using this a lot. There were a lot of event invites that were sitting there, a lot of requests for comments. Um, you, you do get sign of the rubbish about join my influencer network, which you can not worry too much about. But if you are looking to get on those PR lists so you can get invited to the events, to press trips, for meals, all those kind of things. These are great hashtags to just spend, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes a day, pop it in the search in Twitter and then just respond. You know, not that difficult, but it's such a great way to get yourself in front of the eyeballs of these people. Instagram, we couldn't talk about travel blogging if we didn't go a little bit into Instagram. So I call Instagram the beast of the social media world. One thing I'm going to say about Instagram and I'm probably going to annoy a lot of those Insta celebs at the moment is that Instagram is a jerk. Instagram owes you absolutely nothing. It's going to change algorithms. It's going to blacklist hashtags that you've used, it's going to do a whole heap of stuff that is just going to break your heart. And once you just sit there and go, you know what, Instagram, you don't own me. I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want with my life. You will be a lot happier. Instagram is probably one of the most complained about social media platforms that I see. And a lot of clients come to me asking how they can beat Instagram, how they can change Instagram. And I just sit there and say, you can't, you just have to accept it, that some days your posts will have great engagement. Some days your posts will not have great engagement. And it's not worthwhile in my opinion to be spending hours every day, um, you know, just drowning in the horror of Instagram. It's also such a fast changing content platform. When brands come up and they say to me, I only want Instagram, I say no. Um, I say it's not a good long-term objective for you and it doesn't generate really nice evergreen content because that's really what I want to see on my channels personally is content that people can come back to and that they can learn from and not just be inspired from. As you can see, the um, two images, the one in the middle and the one on the right, are my own like fun ones that I've done, I've put out there. Some did okay, some didn't but I'm just not going to get caught up in that. What I do also want to talk about, the one thing that is really amazing with Instagram that a lot of people are not using to the best is Instagram stories. So sometimes people say to me, oh, what is a story? And it's like, it's, it's exactly that, it's a story. So when you think about doing your Instagram stories, every day your story needs to have a beginning, a middle and an end which can be really awkward for someone like me whose audience is fairly evenly split between Australia and the UK, just totally different time zones. So for me, I kind of have to stretch my Instagram stories out over a longer time width than what I normally would like to, just so that I'm capturing both of those audiences. Now, a lot of people also say to me that they don't like the sound of their own voice or they don't like to see themselves on video. And how do you overcome that? So for me, it was just when I do my Instagram stories and it's of me, I film it and I send it out. I don't do heavy editing for it. 
I don't sit there for hours wondering, did my hair look right? Did my glasses look right? All that kind of stuff. I just push it out there. Again, I'm creating content for my audience, but I'm not spending hours curating it because I have better things to do with my time that's going to be more beneficial to myself and my business. But what I did want to show you guys here is this is an Instagram story that I did that is announcing a trip to India that I'm doing at the end of the month. And I've used an app called Unfold. It's free. It does have a paid platform as well if you want different fonts, different um, templates. But all these four templates are free. And the really cool thing about this is that it's all in the Instagram sizing for you. You can change the background colors, the fonts. Like you can see, I've got a few different fonts going on here. I can add photos and I can also add on the same slide a photo and a video. So it's great if you've done a press trip and you go, here's a still of where we were, but here is actually how we got there. If you've got like a hyperlapse video or, or something like that. Um, Vicky from at Make Time to See the World is amazing at doing this, where she has the mixed content within her stories and it's all done with on, Unfold. These also don't take a lot of time. Um, this story did have a few more slides to it, but I think in total it probably took me six or seven minutes. Literally the time, you know, it takes me to have a cup of coffee. You know, I've done this, I've created the content, I've pushed it out. The other thing with Instagram stories is to get that good coverage is to use the hashtags. So just like you do with your Instagram post, have a hashtag or a location. Um, I was watching the Marie Kondo because everyone else is at the moment on Netflix, took a snap of it, hashtag that that one post got like 700 views, like one story. And then the next story, they all dropped off because I was back talking about travel things and not saying thank you to all of my worldly possessions. So again, super simple. You don't need to be in front of the camera talking for hours. Um, you could just create these nice little snippets to have them go out. You can add polls to them. It's just such a great way to engage your audience in a different way. It's the same with Instagram Live. I quite commonly will do an Instagram Live where I'm answering some questions that my audience have sent through because I've done a story, put a question box up. I don't get that many people actually viewing my live at the time. Again, it's a time zone issue for me, but I then put that up. I add it to my stories. It's available for 24 hours, super simple. It's just having that content there for when people are ready to view it. Pinterest, this is another thing that upsets so many of you out there. Pinterest is fundamentally a search engine. It's kind of a prettier version of Google. So a lot of you do really amazing SEO to keep Google happy, but you're not doing SEO for Pinterest. So when you start to think about your pins, you need to go, okay, I need to have a great image with a really clear title as well as a great description using those keywords. Now I use Adobe Spark and these are all my pins for recent articles I've done. And that's all I've done is Adobe Spark. Again, it's another program that has a free element to it and you can pay extra and have your own branding on it. But Adobe is just wonderful at charging us ridiculous amounts of money. So for me, I just use a free platform for it. The other really good thing I really enjoy about using Adobe Spark, Spark over a program like Canva is that you can resize what you've got. So I do um, these pins and then on my blog posts, I resize it. So it's still using the same images to have that as a feature image. It's just the way that I've got my blog set up. But these take me probably 10, 15 minutes to create. And then because I just do the flick of a button and it resizes to that blog post one for me, I'm not spending you know, half an hour on Canva where you would have to, if you had a free version, where you would have to swap it. You know, you have to go out, redo it all, find your images again. I'm just fundamentally a lazy person. I don't want to be spending a lot of time on these kind of tasks. 
So for me, using a program like Adobe Spark makes it so, so much more efficient rather than you know, having to go through lots of different ones. Adobe Spark also has a whole heap of free stock images. So like the beach pin that you can see in the middle, the top and the bottom images are mine, but the long one with the beach umbrellas is not mine. So they're license free um, images you can use there. And it's literally just a search box, just search Australian beaches. And that's kind of what comes up. So Pinterest is also one of those fantastic ones that has a scheduling tool called Tailwind. Um, from memory, it's about 15 US dollars a month. There is a free version, but it's not that great. And they are cracking down on free accounts. The great thing about Tailwind is it's the only Pinterest approved API. So it's the only one where you can set up your, your content schedule and just have it going automatically in the background there for you, pinning to either your boards, you can join tribes. It's got a whole heap of amazing functions behind it. It's the only one that Pinterest won't flag your account as spam. So if you use, there are a few others that I won't mention because if you do use them, it's been well known that they just get spammed and then you get locked out of your account. And for a lot of bloggers, it, Pinterest is a great way to get that traffic to your site. So, uh, another thing that uh, people think travel bloggers are is that we're graphic designers in the making. Um, I'm not a graphic designer. All of these images here are ones that I've done on Adobe Spark. They're ones that I just took off um, their sort of templates there. So again, it's such a great tool to have. You could go on there yourself, get any of these images that are the templates that are already created and you can just change background images, like especially on that last one, the live to travel one, you could just add your own mountain scene there, put in a little bit of text and you're good to go. So I've put a few different sizes there for you to show you the differences. So you've got like blog post to Instagram and a Pinterest one that I've just shrunk down. So it's so much easier, I think, to use a program like Adobe Spark or even Canva that is free rather than having to worry about using a program like InDesign or Photoshop or all those kind of things. Um, again, I'm all about being efficient and I think 2019 will definitely see travel bloggers looking to be more efficient in what they're doing from their content creations, um, both images and the written word. Both are free, so I don't know, just give them a go. See how you go. Feel free to like reach out to me on Twitter and tell me which one you prefer. Photography. Oh, wow. This one is always super contentious. Um, it seems that a lot of brands, especially tourism boards and DMOs, assume that as a travel blogger, you are also a professional photographer in the making. I'm not. Um, I have a Samsung S9 Plus now. That is what I'm doing the majority of my travel photography on because I don't want to carry my mirrorless around and I've never even bothered to look into buying a DSLR because it's just too big. I don't want to kind of carry that all around. But the great tools which you can get just on your phone, they're available both on iOS and Android. I'm not sure if they're available on the Windows phones is Snapseed and Lightroom. So Snapseed is free. It's got a whole heap of different tools, a whole heap of different profiles that you can use on it. It's just not as finely tuned as what Lightroom is. So Lightroom is the smaller version of Photoshop. Again, both of these tools I've got, these apps I've got on my phone and I just use the free versions. So I think Lightroom, when I looked at it, was about 16 or $17 a month to purchase. Um, but if you are doing a lot of photography and you are doing a lot of traveling, it's probably worthwhile paying for that one just because it's got so many, so much power behind it as an editing tool. Whereas for me, a lot of the time I use Snapseed because it's super simple. I don't need to do big little, like big level of editing. And my phone does actually shoot in raw as well. So I can go down into those super fine details. But at this point in time, I'm just not. But again, great tools, super easy to use. And people just don't need to know 
that you're not sitting there at your laptop for two or three hours editing photos. If you are that person that does that, total and complete respect to you. I love looking at your work and I appreciate what you do. Again, it's just not for me. It's not where I've decided to dedicate my time to. So some business basics. One of the biggest complaints that I get from brands when I'm talking to them about how they go working with content creators and bloggers and all of that is they go like the communication just isn't very clear about who's doing what, when and where. Um, the next few slides might annoy a few people because it is so basic, but it's a common complaint that I get so, so often. One of the other really big ones is that you need to be able to provide like your clients, because when you're doing paid works with brands and tourism boards, they are a client, with an invoice that is really easy to read and even more importantly, is really easy to pay. Some people just use PayPal and that, that's fine, but depending on the level of company that you are working for, they might not actually be able to pay you via PayPal or with a PayPal invoice. So that's sort of something to consider as more and more travel bloggers are now realizing their worth and demanding payment for their services and not just doing free stuff. Is it, well, how do I actually get paid? So if you have that invoice there ready to go, well, why can't you get paid? It's, it's about making it as easy as possible for your client. So, oops, sorry, I'll just go back. Um, the program that I use is called Wave Apps. Again, it's another free one. It is available internationally for you. You could set up a template invoice. I've got one that has my bank account details. It's got my ABN on it, which is an Australian business number. I've got you know a postal address on there. I've got all the things that I legally need to have in Australia to provide someone with an invoice. But it's super clear in the what I'm providing and the amount I'm charging and the total amount due. The great thing that I really liked about Wave apps is that it connects to Stripe as a payment system. So I can take credit card payments if I choose to. Again, it's just a button within the program. I flick that on, the invoice goes out to the client. When I have credit card payments on, I find that I get paid within 24 hours of the agreed time. So again, super easy for me to just be able to flick this out, really easy for any of the clients that I'm working with to pay me and then we can go forward with the project. Another one that people have really liked was called Harvest and that's great if you are doing um, time work for people. So if you've got clients who are saying, right, I'll do 10 hours a week for you, you can record and monitor your time and that will convert that onto your invoice for your client. That one is $12 a month though. Um, I don't do billable hours. I do packages for people. So for me, Wave Apps is a lot more simple because I just don't need to be that concerned about having huge amounts of billable hours. Cause it's awful if you're trying to have it going on an Excel spreadsheet and trying to calculate it at the end of the month. Again, all just about being super efficient. Sorry, everyone, getting a bit parched. Contracts are really, really important. Like it is so, so important. I'm a big believer that an email alone does not constitute a contract. So when I worked in marketing, I would send people what we used to call an insertion order. And this always went out on a separate email. Uh, again, if you guys want to reach out to me, I'm quite happy to flick you over an example of what I use as an insertion order. It's super, super basic. You'll be shocked at how basic it is. It literally just lists who is doing what, when, and the conditions around this agreement. So it just keeps it so clear and transparent that there's just no room to argue. So when a client comes back and says, oh, well, you know, you promised me three Instagram posts turn around and go, no, here's the insertion order that you signed. As you can see, it states, I will do one, blah, blah, blah. It's just such a simple step. Again, you just want to avoid having any confusion coming along and any negativity between you and your client. Um, 
about what was agreed upon. And it, it's just, again, it's so simple. Why wouldn't you do it? You don't need to sort of be there and have a massive legal background or pay you know, thousands of dollars to have contracts written up. Though you're welcome to do that. Um, I just think that, you know, if you're certainly, if you're just starting off or if you're getting irregular work, the insertion order just works so, so well. Easing your email burden. I don't have my email listed on my website. When I did, I got like 100 emails a day asking for free work and people wanting to, you know, do SEO backlinks and all kinds of just rubbish emails. So the first thing that I did when I started freelancing and professional travel blogging was that I set up canned responses. I use Gmail at the moment. So for me, it was super easy. You can set up, I think about 20 different canned responses and it just kind of helps sort out the wheat from the chaff. If you're using a program like Outlook, you can actually set up your canned response, but as an email signature so that that way you can just click reply, choose which signature you want and then flick it off. It just means that you're not having to spend, you know, five or 10 minutes a day. If you do want to respond to these emails, um, you know, having to type out things again, super, super efficient. It's just how I like to be. So it also kind of, I found it really did help sort out people that were just wanting free work compared to those who were offering legitimate paid work. So I don't send too many nasty emails anymore when I think someone's being a bit dodgy, but my canned response is just really nice. It's like, hey, thanks for reaching out. Really appreciate it. Um, would like to learn some more. Can you tell me what budget you have in mind? As soon as you add that line in, budget, it really sorts people out. Sometimes I'll come back, they say, we don't have a budget. And then equally as often I get people replying back to me and say, oh, actually, here's our budget. This is what we have to work with. So again, while we're talking the efficiency train, scheduling your content. I just am so, so big on this one. So for me, I use Hootsuite at the moment. I also have previously used Social Pilot. Again, I'm only using the free versions, as you can actually see in the screenshot. It's trying to get me to upgrade. Um, and you can schedule on Twitter and Facebook. A lot of these programs now are allowing you to schedule on Instagram. So, but there's still a bit of like hit and miss with scheduling on Instagram. Is it just a push notification? So you'll get a message on your phone saying, hey, you need to go and schedule, like you need to go and post. Or does it actually post out for you? I believe that Later and Planoly are apps that are Instagram approved for scheduling out Instagram posts. I think Later or Planoly, you can do up to like 40 Instagram posts at a time. And they are very slowly rolling out across these apps, the ability to schedule your stories as well. So again, really great if you are on the road or if you're even not even a full-time blogger, it's great just to be able to schedule your content so that your audience from around the world is still hearing from you. So very quickly, because I think I'm running out of time. Sorry, everybody. Do you need a virtual assistant? This is something that a lot of people ask me, you know, should I get one? What should I have them to do? It's a really personal question. Is it right for you and your business model? Um, if you hate doing Instagram, but you know you need to do Instagram, then yes, look at getting a virtual assistant. I am all for outsourcing the things that I either don't like doing or the things that I can't do. Um, for example, I am not a great web developer. So for me, I've engaged somebody to help me with that. So it's just sort of thinking about where do you want to actually spend your time and your energy um, working on? And it's like, if you really don't like Twitter, have somebody do it for you. You know, you can get VAs from a whole range of places. They vary in prices. A lot of people go to the Philippines and are paying five, six US dollars an hour. But if you are in any of the travel blogging Facebook groups, put a shout out. You'd be surprised how many travel bloggers actually offer that as a service. Okay, everybody, I think you're probably sick and tired of hearing from me now waffle on about being super efficient. It's going to open up if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask. If you don't want to ask them here, you are more than welcome to contact me. There is sort of the main contact points that you can contact me on. 
I'm pretty good at responding to emails fairly efficiently, I'd like to think. Uh, again, I'd love to hear from you if you're on Twitter. Send me a tweet, ask me any questions you want on Twitter. I'm always happy to have a bit of a banter, even if you just want to ask me about the egg that's currently on Instagram. Happy to answer that. So let's open it up to questions. Oh, the egg. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jean. Um, I saw a lot of great info there. So let's move on to questions now. If you'd like to ask Jean a question, you can simply type it into the chat box below or you can raise a hand while I'm with you. To do that, just click on the participants button below and then click to raise your hand over on the right. Uh, I'll then unmute you and you can ask Jean your question. So um, a couple of questions we had earlier on that weren't um, answered was, uh, what is a branded content tool? I think that was from uh, one of your first slides. Okay, cool. So the branded content tool is how Facebook knows that you've done paid work. Um, so it's, it's a way of being open and transparent to your audience saying, I was paid for this work. There's a little bit of a debate about whether gifted products is paid. Facebook considers gifted products the same as a monetary payment. So the branded content tool, when you go to post on your Facebook um, page, there's kind of a whole heap of buttons right down the bottom, you know, add photos, add a poll. There will be one called branded post, uh, branded content that literally is like two little hands shaking. Um, and if you click on that, it then asks you to tag your business partner. So, you know, for example, I would tag Travel Massive. Travel Massive then gets a notification that I've tagged them in a post as a business partner. And the actual post itself up the very top will say, you know, Traveling Honeybird in partnership with Travel Massive. So it is one of those tools that you have to apply for. Um, and if you just Google um, Facebook branded content tool, it should pop up with where you apply for it. I say Google it because some people got it. I just got it automatically. I don't have a lot of Facebook fans. I'm like 4,000 or something. So it was really odd to me that I got that automatically, but other people who have got, you know, 10, 20,000 followers didn't have it. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, another question um, was what phones shoot in raw? Oh, so I have the Samsung S9 Plus. Uh, so the new Samsung Galaxies, uh, they have the option now of shooting in RAW, which is fabulous um, because I can sit there with my tripod. I've been playing around a lot with night photography, like long exposure, and that is just fantastic to be able to shoot that in RAW. You can change all of the settings on it. Again, I'm not a professional photographer, so I'm not too sure about like the correct terminology here, but I do just know that it is super easy. It's literally, I just swipe across on the top of my screen and I shoot like click raw. So a lot of people I know are using these um, like raw photos to edit them and then to sell them on. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. So what, uh, what do you use to edit the phone videos? The phone videos, oh, hang on. I'm actually going to open my phone to make sure I've got the right name of the app. So do, 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 do. the one that I've been using is Filmora Go. That one's been pretty good. But the, another one that I've been using, which um, a photographer told me about was InShot. So they're both available on iOS and Android services. And they're really good if I'm doing video editing to cut them, slow them down. They've also got the license free music so that you can add music to your videos and not worry about stealing somebody's work. Wow, fantastic. That's great to know. <laughs> um, so Kathy asked, uh, what's wrong with using PayPal? Well, there's a few things that I personally don't like uh, with PayPal. One is the fact that it's really easy for people to put in a complaint about um, 
like that you haven't they haven't received a service and then you've got to deal with a PayPal dispute and all that kind of stuff but in more so of a business sense uh, when I've worked in corporate gigs in my younger days PayPal requires a credit card to be paid um, most of the time so it's quite difficult if you are working for a big brand or even like a small company that may only have like a corporate card that it's quite difficult to get paid it's really good if it's just you know you're doing work with bloggers and whatnot and i know a lot of affiliate programs use paypal to pay you into that's totally fine but for creating invoices and sending it to a business it can just cause issues you know sometimes people don't understand how to actually pay a paypal invoice i had that recently i had to have somebody re uh, reissue an invoice for a client because when she sent it to them, she's like, oh, and here's my PayPal email. And if you're certainly, if you're dealing with somebody that's not that tech savvy, PayPal can just be a little bit too much of a hurdle um, when it comes to paying invoices. Like I use it all the time when I buy stuff. It's not a problem for that. It's just in that business sense, it can become a little bit more sort of difficult. And that's what I like about the Wave apps is when I've got my invoice there, there's literally a button that says pay now and you click on that and it takes you to a credit card payment form, you know? So it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I use uh, Wave Apps myself, have been using that for years. Uh, and it's also just a fantastic way of um, knowing, like budgeting for all of your travel blogging, um, what's coming in, what's going out, all, yeah. all of that accounting stuff is really great to know as well. Uh, so Lucy has asked, um, are there any other sources of income I could look into aside from paid articles and sponsored posts? Look, there certainly is like affiliate marketing. If done well, you can make some really good coin off. So uh, the, I would say to go and have a look at Sharon Gourlay. She is one of the Melbourne Travel Massive members and she runs a page called Digital Nomad Wannabe that has loads of free articles on monetizing your blog, but certainly around affiliate marketing and SEO. So all about getting the right readers to your blog to then purchase from you by using the most sort of um, adequate, not adequate, but the most beneficial terminology and systems to convert your readers into buyers. So again, um, Sharon Gourlay, Digital Nomad Wannabe. She's also got an amazing Facebook group that she runs challenges in. I think there's over 5,000 people now in that group. And it's fantastic if you've got questions. You know, so if you're like, uh, you know, how do I get Amazon to work? You know, there will be 20 people there that will be able to walk you through issues that they had and how they resolved it. It's just an amazing community. So. Okay, fantastic. So um, another question was, uh, I think going back to what we we're talking about with Instagram and social media in general, um, are press trips classified as branded as well? I classify them as branded because I have had previous content where I have tagged the tourism board and Facebook says, no, that's branded. So Facebook will also go through and it will look at your blog and it will see if it thinks that's a paid post or not. So for me, when I do press trips, personally, I tag them as a branded partner, but not everybody does. It's very contentious about should you or shouldn't you and does it affect your reach? I've found that it hasn't affected my reach. Great, thank you. So Helena would like to know uh, a little bit more about how to actually get paid work and how to find paying clients. This is always really tricky. Um, the thing that I say is first is to really have nailed down your media kit and a rates card, like really actually know your audience, know like in depth, know them, have examples of what they like to read, how they like to um, engage with you and then know what you want from working with a brand. So if you're going to send out a pitch email, have it super clear. Um, I do influencer marketing campaigns for several brands and it's amazing how many times I'll get an email. It's a thousand words long. It doesn't tell me why I should work with them or what the, the person is even offering. 
So that's the first thing I'd say is have your media kit and your rate cards locked down so that you're really confident with them. And don't be afraid to go out and cold pitch companies. There are also a couple of other websites. Um, there is Cooperatize. It's a little bit slow at the moment. Um, there is also Copy Press. Copy Press, though, you do have to jump through a lot of hoops. Um, you've got to take a lot of tests to show that you have a high level of English. Um, and they all have paid writing gigs available on there. So another thing is to sign up to Trav Media. The newsletter stuff comes through there. And also check the Travel Massive jobs board. Like so many people just seem to forget that Travel Massive has an amazing jobs board. And there's some truly unique things that come through there. Sadly, not many of them are in Australia for me because there's been a few lately that I'm like, I could do that. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for mentioning uh, the Travel Massive Jobs Board, of course. Uh, so Ian wants to know, have you got paid work or partnerships from attending conferences? I've gotten paid partnerships from attending conferences. But the big thing I will say about that is that you need to break away from hanging and drinking with your friends, which is really hard because sometimes you, know, <laughs> you don't see them, like it can be a year between seeing them and going out and networking outside of the official networking zones that um, a lot of these conferences have. The speed networking style is fine for some people, but it is also can just be overload for the people that are just, you know, spending maybe two or three hours getting pitched to. So I would say that the most important thing is to go out there and to talk to people and just have a really nice conversation with them. I've gotten a lot of work from you know, attending Travel Massive events and also attending these travel blogger conferences where I'm just having a conversation with somebody, I drop what I do, it's just you know, mentioned in conversation and then a day or two later, you know, you'll get an email following up, oh, hey, we met at blah, 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 let's work together or how could we work together? Oh, fantastic, that's some uh, really good tips there. So uh, Barbara, this is a pretty open question from Barbara. Um, <laughs> tips for building your audience. Yep. So I always say the number one thing about building your audience is having great content. So whether you're doing it on social media or on your own website, you know, people kind of always go on and on about doing loads of SEO, which is great because that does bring traffic to your site. But sometimes I read people's posts and I'm like, it's so SEO focused. It's actually not good content. So the number one tip I always say is just have amazing engaged content. Um, my blog, for instance, is coffee fueled adventure travel, a really weird niche, I know. And I have a whole area called lessons from Jean, which are really like, it's just me ranting because I'm my own editor. So I can do that. And those posts actually go really well because people like to see that authenticity, that honesty, you know, I I'm not an Instagram celebrity sitting at a beach with a big floppy hat and the sundress on, you know, I'm actually a person. And that's really what people, I feel, want to see at the end of the day. You know, they want good advice, but they also want to know who you are as a person. So I definitely start off with creating the good content and then doing stuff like being on Twitter, participate in chats. Fantastic. So um, this isn't uh, a question, but I just wanted to share it with everybody because I think it's really important um, and lovely. And Alex has said, thanks for sharing this. I'm starting to realise my worth as a travel blogger thanks to this conversation. I just think that's fantastic because, um, you know, travel blogging, you don't have to be working for free, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Let's get that really, really, uh, really clear. Yeah. Um, so Jane's asked about rate cards. I think there's been a few questions pop up about rate cards and how do you price and how do you value what you do? Um, for me, I, I've come from a business background. I used to consult. I know what companies pay. I've been in marketing. I know what traditional media rates are. For me, my, my costs have to cover, you know, not just my, my time, my overheads, you know, my internet's not free, my phone's not free, all those kind of things. I also have two dogs and a horse that I need to feed. I also like food. So for me, when I thought about my rates, it was like, well, how long is this going to take me to do and what's the minimum cost? And if I was back working a corporate job, how much would I earn per day? I have 
uh, on my website. So if you go to my website, like, like once you hop off this and you can go to the work with us page, I list my rates. Um, I'm not afraid to hide them. Those are the base rates that I work for. And that's a recent thing that I've done. I've changed rather than saying to people, contact me and we'll have a discussion. I've got some figures there and that has worked really well for me. Um, also, Mike from Bemuse Backpacker has the same thing. If you're not based in Australia and you want to see what someone charges, um, like UK and the European market, he again is very open about his rates um, and what, what you get for the money that you're paying for. So go there, have a look at what other people are charging. Again, feel free to drop me an email if you guys need some guidance or some advice, I'm happy to help. So. Okay, excellent. Um, so I guess this is just a follow up question to the press trip uh, one as well. Um, how do you turn a press trip into a paid one or even a free accommodation by a hotel or resort and turn it into a paid gig? Um, yeah, this one's always fun. Um, firstly, it's not free accommodation. It's an exchange of services. So the first thing is to change your mindset nothing about this and what we do is actually free. It's an exchange of services. So if you are pitching, like sending out emails, you're going to a destination, start off with that mindset of this is what I'm offering here are my rates. Sometimes and a lot of the time, because there are so many people out there that are willing to do it for free. And this is a huge issue in Australia. It is really, really difficult to get actual paid work compared to if I was based in say America or Europe, you know, it's a very different sort of mindset that both um, the bloggers and the brands had. So the first thing that I would say is to start off the conversation about it's paid work for you. And then the press trip one is really difficult because sometimes if you're working with a tourism board, a lot of the times those tourism boards, they pay for everything as well. So, you know, they pay for your hotels, your transports. They might get a government rate at hotels. They are putting out a lot of money for the trip. So you do have to be a little bit more careful that if you're just demanding payment up front, they just might turn around and go, well, no, because we'll just go to the next person on the list and they won't charge us anything for the opportunity. But the thing that I always do is I try value add up for people. So when people have reached out to me and they've said, hey, do you want to come on this trip? Here's uh, deliverables. If they do give you deliverables, I say, hey, that's great. Have you got budget to do so much more? You know, I start talking about, you know, maybe it's more Instagram posts or it's stories or it's, you know, I will pitch it to a larger audience. Um, again, I use Trav Media and I put call out saying, hey, I'm going to, like, again, my trip to India that's happening at the end of the, this month. I'm going here. This is what I'm doing. You know, would anybody be interested in paying for the story? So sometimes it's working with the tourism board to get paid, but then go into other avenues and go, maybe I can get paid from somebody else. It's kind of like the payment tree. You have to go along all the branches. Absolutely. I guess that kind of um, goes back to that comment before about um, your worth as travel bloggers and you know nothing should be free always ask to be paid you guys are worth it <laughs> and so, yeah. i'd just like to say also like with the the press trips thing sometimes like either they don't have money or sometimes it's a really great experience so don't feel bad if you do decide to do it comped it's a bit of a tricky situation sometimes Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you guys will have to decide whether something's worth it or not worth it. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that something's going to be a bad gig in case it's, it's not being paid in money. There's still sometimes incentives that are worth it <laughs> that aren't actual money, uh, though I think generally that's not often the case. <laughs> okay, so Bella's just asking, um, Will the full session be shared later for viewing? So yes, for anybody that joined um, a bit later, um, we are going to, this session has been recorded and it will be shared um, hopefully later today if I get to it. I think I probably will. So I think that uh, looks to be the last of the questions, but um, I mean, I hope we've 
answered everything. Um, there were a lot of questions, so I hope I got to them all. Um, if I didn't, or if you think of uh, anything later on, you are welcome to email Jean at travelinghoneybird at gmail.com or myself um, at Kirstie at travelmassive.com. So thank you so much for joining everyone. Um, obviously, thanks again, Jean. Um, and of course, please don't forget to sign up for our upcoming webinars as well. So thanks again, again everyone. Bye.